Okay, folks, uh, we are now recording. So um, Mr. Patrick can have his video up, but you guys can't because, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to, because that's going to go public. I mean, who goes to my YouTube channel? You guys sometimes, but who knows? Uh, share this. Hope it works. Yay. Okay. If I see that, thumbs up. Okay. And, um, let me set up my chat. Uh, now, Mr. Patrick's here in case you all uh, have a question. He'll, he'll see the chat there. I've kind of got my hands full with this thing. There we go. Now, occasionally I'll be asking you to give me a thumbs up, and that's partly to see if you're awake. Um, and I'll ask a couple of questions to see uh, for you to give some Insta stamps. Insta stamps. All right, so we are remote. Uh, let's first talk about that. Um, tomorrow, I, I don't know what they decided. I think they'll make the decision today within the next hour or two. Uh, what about tomorrow? Now, tomorrow's these are three things. It could be could be going to school, which I'm starting to doubt that. Two would be remote again, which is fine. Or three would be a snow day. They owe us a daggone snow day. We get five a year. We've done four. We get one more. They said, well, we're not going to make Wednesday a snow day because what if Thursday people don't have electricity? Well, the ice never came. I mean, sleet is not the same thing. So it does not, power lines aren't coming down. So people do have electricity. So there's no reason why we couldn't make tomorrow a snow day. But we'll wait and see what they say. If we are a snow day, same thing. If we are a, a remote, same thing. So what I decided to do, because this is, in this way, we're not wasting our time. So I'm going to, um, do history, the same history we would do next week, but instead of taking up 20 minutes class time, we'll just take up this time and then I'll record it and I'm recording now. And so uh, if you zone out or you want to go back and watch or you say you missed for some reason, then uh, you can watch it later and it'll be up uh, by five this afternoon. It'll be on the YouTube channel and I'll put a link. Okay. So we're mostly, and we, I want to talk about packet five but um, we didn't get to it yeah, first, second or third hour. We didn't get to it. So I guess we won't hear either. All right, so uh, let's take a look and see what's going on now. Obviously no stamp check today, but I will, when we get back, whether it's tomorrow, Friday or Monday, we will do a uh, stamp check for take home test part B. Now uh, take home test for 4B four part two. Should say. Um, I, well, I think I had that due Sunday night. I'm going to switch to Monday night so that you can still get your stamps, you know, Monday for it and then turn it in Monday evening. Okay. Test is on for Thursday next week. You know, stop me or yell out or tell Mr. Patrick or chat if you have questions. I, I've been doing a lot of, I spent so much time on this daggone sheet. It looks a lot better now than it does there. That's old. I got a bunch of new stuff on there. It's cool, but it's just taken up forever. So I will have, I'll have uh, as, um, you know, I'll have these done. But what you're seeing is mostly done, but it'll, it'll be better by the time I finally put them up on the guides. Yesterday in class, we did this with the, uh, the taped in um, duet trio talking about, you know, shooting something from like, like we would do if, if we're there tomorrow, we're going to be in the hallway shooting. And if we're there Friday, maybe we'll do that too. But uh, if we're gone Thursday and Friday, then I'm going to have to drop that lab, which is bad because it's one of my favorite labs. Kids like it. Chance at 18 bonus points. Plus you're shooting out in the hall. You're not sitting listening to me, but I got to get to some things. We've got a lot of things to cover. Okay. So last time we did talk a little history. The history we're talking about right now is um, 
intricately tied in with World War II uh, and all the stuff going on. Um, so uh, we talked about this. Okay, let, let me first talk about this, then I'll have Mr. Patrick jump in for a second. Um, so we did last time we talked about Fritz London, uh, London Dispersion Forces. Uh, he's the guy that figured out how uh, friction works. We will spend a half a period coming up in packet five on friction, since we are talking forces. Uh, we'll talk about the chemistry of friction. Uh, also, 1932, we talked about uh, Subramanyan Chandrasekhar. Probably destroyed that, but talk about white dwarfs and how our sun would become a white dwarf. So in 32, he was already talking about that, but we still had no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera. We still had no idea how stars worked. No one understood how cores of stars worked in 1932. We could look at the big picture, but we still didn't understand the mechanism. Okay. Also in 1932, we talked about Chadwick discovering the neutron in that little tiny I guess this is a good time for, uh, well, let me finish this. And then we talked about um, Zwicky, that's a bad picture of him, but the Swiss astronomer talking, figuring out the idea, thinking about there has to be some kind of dark matter. I uh, also figured out that there's gotta be neutron stars. So I did a lot of things and didn't get a whole lot of credit for it until recently. All right, now, um, so let's talk about, today we're gonna talk about these four things, uh, Paul Dirac, uh, won a Nobel Prize in 1933, but mostly for the work he did in the 1920s. Uh, and then we'll talk about these other things as well. Okay, so um, yeah, before we get to the other thing, let's just let's talk about Dirac for a minute. All right, so uh, PM Dirac, uh, he, he was English. Um, there's a book that I've read about, uh, I read about half of it and I finally gave up on it. He's just too, he's too abstract for me. He's, he's all mathematical. He's like the perfect link between mathematics and physics. Um, because when, when you go into quantum, especially with matrices, it's all, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to, and it's all complex numbers, it's all imaginary numbers, not all. There's a real component and imaginary component. And it's very difficult to talk about that. You, you need a special person. I mean, we had to have Paul Dirac or we would never understand a lot about quantum. So he's extremely important. He's, the other physicists bow down to him and he is the, and mathematicians, uh, he's the man, uh, the strangest man. And he is an odd duck. So um, we'll talk about his equation here in a minute. Kind of to show you, he was not. I suppose he's probably he. I hate to venture a guess, but he wasn't social. He was extremely focused. That's that's Asperger's, right? I mean, that's the whole. I'm not saying he was, but he had the, which is a form of autism. But Newton was the same thing. Uh, a lot of professors are somewhat or a little bit autistic. Uh, if you ever talk to him, I talked to a lot of them, and they. They can be very social, but they can also be very focused. And so Dirac had that ability to focus. Anyway, here's an anecdote, uh, and I'll just paraphrase it, but uh, he and Heisenberg were, Werner Heisenberg were heading for Japan on a ship for 1929 for a conference. And, uh, you know, Heisenberg's having a blast. He's, he's partying with everybody. He's dancing with all the girls. And uh, Dirac said, Dirac asked him, why do you dance? And then Heisenberg said, well, uh, because these are nice girls and it's a pleasure. And so uh, Dirac pondered that for a minute. And then he said, but Heisenberg, how do you know beforehand that the girls are nice? <laughs> what mathematical formula do I need to put? It's a little like um, Beautiful Mind. Have you ever seen that movie uh, where he, he puts, he actually won the Nobel Prize, the guy, what's his name? I forget his name, remember his name? Mr. Patrick? Uh, no, know. I've seen it, but I can't yeah. remember. Anyway, he, he did put a formula while, as, while watching girls at a bar. He did come up with a formula that's used in economics and won the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, Josh Nash. Like, what? 
Josh Come Nash. Ahead. There it is, Nash, the great John Nash, or Josh Nash. The great John Nash. So the point is that some of these people like Dirac that are that we that maybe in high school they don't fit in, like they're that kid in the corner, the boys and girls, they end up winning a Nobel Prize because they focus. And sometimes in bot ball, I have kids that are focused and they've, they've gone on to do amazing things because uh, I watch them. They're like 50 years old now. I watch them do amazing things in life or become professors and stuff. Uh, and it's just that, I, that way of focusing. That's what Dirac had. All right. So um, he came up with the Dirac equation, which I have here. Now, uh, obviously, it won't be on the test, but I... Okay, so this, let's, I've been studying this today, trying to make heads or tails out of it. And there's some things out of this Dirac equation that we can understand. There's some things that we get. Um, and that's what you should do. Any kind of crazy equation, as long as the suitcase isn't too big, you know what I mean? You know what suitcase is like, you know, uh, force is, has a mass and acceleration. Well, acceleration is a suitcase because it has change in position, it has time in it. So these little, like things that go into making other things, they're like, so the big thing is a suitcase. So there are some suitcases here. I'll show you one. Well, there's a big one. That's uh, Schrodinger's equation there. Uh, one of them here, that's Schrodinger's. We, we studied Schrodinger's equation. Uh, the X is, X represents space, uh, one dimension of it. Of course, T is time. M, that's the rest mass of electrons. Somebody else find something that you know and, and, and pipe up, tell me what you know. Rest mass of an electron is the M there. All right, uh, uh, I'll open up. Oh, I see some chats over there. Uh, Mr. Patrick's holding out on me here. Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, there's reactions there. I don't have reactions. Oh, so I was telling them to give me thumbs up and some people last hour couldn't do it. And so they just typed thumbs up. So, uh, yeah, and that's what Patrick said. If you type thumbs up, all right. Anyway, so now on the chat, um, tell me, well, give me something else on here that looks familiar. If you're wrong, you're wrong. But let me know what you think on this Dirac equation and, and by the way, the Dirac equation uh, explains how fermions work. And look, these are fermions right here. Where do they go? All right, these are fermions. This is the standard model for everything in our universe that we know of, um, everything real. But these that I'm circling in red, these are the fermions. So fermions are like electrons, uh, protons, neutrons, Okay, so all these things that have uh, mass, uh, the red here, these are um, bosons, and bosons are like force carriers. And we talked about, we've talked about photons, we talked about gluons a while back when we talked about quarks, they, they hold quarks kind of together to keep, it, keep the uh, strong force at bay. Um, and then there's, well, they, they are strong force, but they keep that electromagnetic force at bay. Uh, photons are electromagnetics, and then the, the Z and the W bosons are, <clears throat> are involved in uh, decay, radioactive decay, beta, that kind of thing. And then these are all uh, put up in a Higgs field. Well, Higgs, the Higgs boson is not a fermion. So the point is that all of what this equation describes, if you're into this kind of stuff, is what fermions do. Okay. So who's got a, who's got something else on this? Look at this formula and tell me, can you see anything else there that we have talked about? And there is, there's a couple of things we've talked about. Who, who knows? Who's got, them? who's with me? Okay, thank you. So Ian uh, Poole, oh, Ian, Ian, <clears throat> Ian, Ian gets a stamp. Uh, oh, oh, no, the other E. That's not me, other Ian. No, that, that's the other Ian. Yeah, Ian pulls a stamp. Uh, and he gets, he said, C, C, 
the speed of light. So that is true. So we got do, 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 do. this is speed of light. This is speed of light. Okay. Somebody else give me something. Those odd derivatives. Oh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the odd derivative, these are called partial derivatives. We have talked about partial. That's a partial derivative of the wave function with not with respect to x, but with respect to time. Uh, yeah, they have multivariables, so they own, but it only pulls out, like in this case, you're only finding how, how the, in this case over here, how the uh, Schrodinger's equation, the wave equation is changing with time, not with position. Uh, the other thing on here that we know about, we don't know about, but we, we're going to talk about a lot in packet five is this little guy. This is lil p. Lil p stands for momentum. So something that Newton came up with um, and Descartes, but more Newton. Momentum. And momentum in mechanics is very simple. We've mentioned this before. Lil p is a vector and it's equal to the mass of an object times its velocity. That's this very simple version of it. But that is what that little p is. So we, it turns out that momentum is conserved, okay? In all physics, everything I can think of, it's, it's conserved in stars and in car wrecks, uh, football games, but it's also conserved in quantum mechanics. Uh, which is a crazy. So this is a, it's one of the, there's three fundamental, which we'll learn next week, the week after, three fundamental laws and mechanics and controversial momentum is one of them. So that little P, you see that a lot. Uh, okay, so here's the alpha. The alpha is kind of weird. Check this out. Ah, oh, that, that's not the alpha. I'm sorry. Alpha is another thing. This, what, what I'm looking at is, oh, and by the way, the I there, that I is what you learn in algebra. That is imaginary. Imaginary numbers. So there's a whole, and this H is a reduced Planck's constant. Um, and the B, the beta out there, I'm not sure. I ain't got to that yet. I'm not sure what that is. Anyway. Uh, so we, when you first come up with a new equation, you first come across a new equation, your textbook or something, Start, 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 don't get afraid of it. Go in and start looking at it and pulling things out and then thinking, wait, okay, that's a direct relationship. As that goes up, that goes up. Oh, that's squared. Oh, wow. So it really affects, so the speed of light makes a lot of difference. Uh, you know, or that's a partial derivative only with respect to time. So start, look, start diagnosing uh, the equation. Well, this I, with all these partials, that is a tensor. So we talked about tensors, which are fancy, they're matrix, this is a matrix tensor. So they're, they're like fancy vectors. Um, and that's what I mean by suitcase. You open that thing up, you open this up and look what pops out. Uh, so all these really are their own kind of suitcase. All right, so I'm getting I'm getting away from where we're trying to get to. We're just we're just talking general ideas, and but the point is, this is the mind of Paul Dirac um, that developed this mathematical model. He was, like I say, all of the physicists bow down to him, even Richard Feynman, who everybody else bows down to Feynman. Feynman bows down to Paul Dirac because he could, because his mind, perhaps autistic, I don't know, high, high, like highly functioning. Uh, Asperger's uh, could focus on this. Not necessarily girls. He couldn't. He couldn't understand girls. He could not come up with a mathematical formula. If only. If only. Um, okay. So here is uh, complex numbers. You know the idea that you learned. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you learned about complex numbers in your uh, in your algebra class, or say thumbs up. You guys have heard of complex numbers? They still teach that stuff. They taught me. Okay, so Seth saw it. Um, who else? Anybody else ever uh, learn about complex numbers? Really? Uh, Lexi, nothing? Nothing? 
Shania, no, nothing, Shania. Um, okay, so Lexi says yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I forced it out of her. So I'm not going to tell you to explain them to me. I just want to know if you've heard about them. So these are complex numbers. There's a real domain and a imaginary domain. And I spent the last 20 minutes before I came on reading about complex numbers. I'm ready to go take a nap now. Uh, there's some Euler's in there, you know, Euler's formula. Uh, Descartes was, was into them. Um, they've been around really since Descartes, 1540s, even before that, but as far as calling imaginary numbers. Well, the rack, and they're used in what's called phase calculus, something called phase calculus. Uh, but they're used a lot in electronics. Um, and impedance is all about complex numbers. So they are, do have a lot of, when I mean, when I learned them in high school, I thought, why? I had to know on a test, I had no idea. Then I hear about them at all, hardly in college. But if you go into advanced electronics or you go into quantum mechanics, or into math theory, you hear about them all the time, uh, and complex geometry. So they are big, um, and and this this is the I. The reason I bring it up is that's a big part of this uh, Dirac formula. Okay, and I've talked way too much about fermions and imaginary numbers in Dirac. Anyway, the point is, you know, more than you'll ever need to know. There's Dirac talking to uh, my hero, Richard Feynman. Uh, there's Dirac. Okay, so let's move on. We got we got all the rest is doing six minutes. Uh, so 1936, uh, they you have these iron like iron filings, like I mean microscopic, um, and in a in some type of a matrix that allows them to rotate to move. Uh, and so when you put them in a strong magnetic field, like a coil here. Uh, that produces a magnetic field. You wrap, you wrap, uh, you know, uh, wires. You like a transformer here. You wrap these wires around there. You'll get a magnetic field, and then uh, say send a signal from a sound wave or something, turn it into an electronic signal, and then you put that into this wire, and then that will take these uh, filings, these um, um, iron, I suppose, some type of metal that can then align themselves with that magnetic field uh, and then you can play it back. You can play it back, send it back into it on a woofer and send it back into this air as sound waves. And so you can then record. So in 1936, we finally started recording. Uh, we could, it was, uh, it's all prototyping then. And uh, it wasn't until the 19, eight tracks and reel to reels. That's all like 1960s. So it was a while late 60s for eight tracks. So it was a while before it came in commercial use. But anyway, so uh, magnetic uh, tape recordings then could be done starting in 1936. 1937, um, radar. Now, somebody on the chat tell me when was uh, Pearl Harbor? Type it in. When was Pearl Harbor? Who's with me? When's Pearl Harbor? what you know about World War II, Pearl Harbor. Right. No. Okay, uh, Brady's in 1938. He's close, he's close. He's in the right vicinity. Uh, people were saying, you know, 1965. Uh, so 1938 is pretty close. 1941, Lexi got it. Uh, it's perfectly fine to look it up. 1941, December 7th, 1941. Um, a day that will live in infamy, as FDR said, uh, my mom was a, a little teenage girl living on a farm and she heard about, she heard it her, on the radio in her bedroom, ran out and told my, her parents, my grandparents, and they didn't believe her because they couldn't believe that the Japanese would bomb Pearl Harbor, but they did. And we knew the thing is, the reason I bring it up is in 1937, uh, this is a British guy, Robert Watson develops this radar but America knew it and we had installed it at, in Hawaii. We, we, were, we, we saw them coming. Uh, and so the, 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 the operator there, so brand new technology, the operator said, hey, we got these blips on the screen, all these little blips. And so first of all, oh, that's a flock of birds. 
And he, the operator was not satisfied with that. So he took to the commanding officer. He comes down, looks at it and says, well, we're expecting a, a squadron of B-29s coming in. And so that's what that is. That's gotta be what that is. And he blew it off. So we would have had an hour's warning if we'd actually used the technology. So anyway, 937 radar, and it becomes much better now. Now we have Doppler radar, and we can look and say whether the water, whether the water drops are coming towards us, or whether they're going away from us. You know, a tornado, you get the red, you get the green. So it's a lot more, but it's still the, the idea, the concept of bouncing signals off of objects started in 1937 radio waves okay and finally i'm down to a couple minutes left and here's the big one uh this guy right here hans beth uh figured out and here he is right they're riding little bicycles because they use those in cyclotrons uh to get around because those things are so big uh so the, like the scientists ride little these little bicycles little small little bicycles um okay and that picture squished down so let's see if look they look like they're little people uh, but anyway, he, Hans Beth discovered how uh, the core of stars, not just our star, but in, well, not every star, just our size stars work, how they create energy. And we've looked at this. Now tell me, go on the uh, chat and somebody tell me, what is that little snaky thing there? For the stamp, what's that snaky thing? What's that deadly snaky thing? Gamma ray. Okay, so Cynthia got that one. It's a gamma ray, which that's what's formed. That's the that's what we want. The neutrino there that doesn't do anything for us. It goes right through us. There's billions of them in the room right now. Uh, but when the when the hydrogen hits a deuterium, um, uh, no, when the hydrogen hits a helium, uh, or a deuterium hits a helium. Uh, that's a, a deuterium is a hydrogen atom with a neutron. There's not many of those. It's heavy hydrogen. Uh, but anyway, when that hits a helium atom, you get this, and that's the that's deadly. But it's the um, you know the source of all life on Earth because it's got to go through the whole entire sun to get to us, right? It's it's formed in the core. It may take a we have we had pictures of this. Remember this from last semester comes in and jag, jag back and forth and that Brownian motion kind of thing. And finally, maybe a hundred thousand, maybe in a million years later, it finally comes out and then it takes eight minutes to get to earth. But as it's being bounced around, it's being destructively interfered with. And so the frequency drops from uh, that high frequency gamma ray to lower frequencies, light, you know, Roy G. Biv, ultraviolet and infrared. Anyway, so this guy, Hans Beth, um, he was born in Germany, became American citizen. He figured out how stars work and how our sun, our stars of our size works. Okay, it's a different it's a carbon cycle. It's a different cycle for larger, for blue giants. Okay, um, now I am over my time. And the next thing, next thing is the uh, tomorrow. So if we're doing, if we're doing, uh, turn this, turn this, hold on, I'm almost done. If we're doing this tomorrow, uh, stop sharing. Okay, so if we're doing this tomorrow, then we'll do the other history and maybe we'll get to packet five, at least talk about it some. So don't feel so bad doing this because we would have wasted, not wasted, we would have spent the time next week doing history in class anyway. So I'm saving our 20 minutes that we can spend doing physics. You know, uh, this is physics, but I mean, not just lecture. Okay, so I guess Zoom's okay for lecture. Uh, I'm recorded it. Who's got a question? I know you guys got things to do. I don't know, anybody heard anything about tomorrow? Anybody out there heard anything about tomorrow? Nope. Hey, Jamie, you heard anything about tomorrow yet? My oh, wife. Ah, she's ignoring me. Okay, so uh, we'll keep looking for that. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you in class. Otherwise, we'll have a snow day. Okay, so stick around with questions. Otherwise, you're free to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody's here. Look at that. Pretty awesome. Everyone's here that I can see. Who's missing? Uh, I got the best attendance of any teacher at Norman High School. Hey, Mr. 
Esky, oh. I got uh, uh hold, hold, learning hold, for Thursday. Hold. Yeah, I wanted Ian to say something. I forgot. Uh, say the thing you said during second hour about uh, physics and World War II. Um, yeah, I'm sharing my screen here. Cool. Um, I just wanted to show you real quick. Uh, oh, you go back. So this is just Rutherford, and this is his gold foil experiment. I mean, this thing fits on a desk. I mean, really, it's very small. And the cost of all science prior to World War II was just tens of millions of dollars. And then here we have uh, Meitner, Hans, and Frisch. I'm not sure how you say that last name, Frisch. Yeah, Frisch. And um, this is the lab in which they discovered nuclear fission. And what's crazy about this and what people don't realize is World War II was a huge stepping stone for physics and science in general because the size of science became so much bigger. And this is what I mean. Uh, while nuclear fission was found, was discovered in a small lab, this is one of dozens of facilities that the Manhattan Project uh, took up and it costs over $2 billion. And that's ten, tens of billions of dollars today. And remember that all science got, uh, funded prior to World War II was just tens of millions. This is over 2 billion. And hundreds of thousands of people worked on the Manhattan Project and thousands of scientists and mathematicians from different uh, fields. And uh, that is still true today because here is a picture of the Hadron Collider. This is just the map of it. Uh, it's underground, of course. And it has cost $4.75 billion. And that is not adjusted for inflation. That's just today's money. So World War II became the moment in which the United States started to view physicists as their first line of defense in the war. And because of that, because of the creation of the atomic bomb, people started to take physics and science really seriously. I just can wanted to share that with you. It's, yeah, no, it's just, can, you, it's an, can you send me those pictures you, you, you had? They're good pictures. Uh, can you yeah, just send me or, or just text me those and I'll put all that those to our tonight. Um, yeah, so uh, in fact, they're the large heterocolor and now CERN is looking to build a bigger one. And of course, yeah, I America, saw that. Yeah, America's, we had one in Waxahachie, would have changed Norman totally, but then we pulled the plug after about $4 billion spent. So now it's a big hole in the ground that's useless, but that, that's America for you. Anyway, so CERN is putting bigger one. We, we want to know, that that gets us to mm, almost speed of life, but we want to get even closer. We want to get further back in time uh, to understand what, fundamental particles are anyway um so thank you all that was good and i'll see you tomorrow one way or another well unless it's snow day then enjoy yourself all right bye uh, uh stick Nassim, around. yeah stick around if you have a question go ahead Ian. the norman public schools website says remote learning tomorrow okay so we are uh, we are back tomorrow then, it's at two o'clock, same, same time, same bat. It's going to be the same uh, Zoom, okay, unless somebody starts, you know, crashing us. I'm going to keep the same Zoom, unless uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin uh, crashes our Zoom, um, uh, then, then we'll be the same one, okay? So I'll see you guys tomorrow, uh, two o'clock, uh, two, 2.30, all right. Ah, bell rang. See you tomorrow, Mr. Esky. All right, see you. Hey, Jamie, remote learning tomorrow, too. <laughs>